Hello, Buzzkillers. It's the professor here, and I hesitate to call myself Professor Buzzkill because I've just been caught recently in a terrible error. The show we had on the evolution of baseball, the the, the quote unquote inventor of baseball, played up the story of Alexander Cartwright rather than Double, and Abner Doubleday as the an inventor of baseball. And then, of course, as we have the best listeners in the world, one of the most important historians of baseball, Richard Hirschberger, emailed me within an hour of the show coming out to tell me that I'd gotten the Cartwright story wrong and that I'd exaggerated it as much as it had been exaggerated elsewhere. So he very kindly agreed to come on the show, and he's here with us today. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hello. I am doing well. And, and this is how I often introduce myself to people, by telling them where they're wrong. <laughs> I'm very popular. Well, I they know. love me at parties. It's, one, it's exactly one of the things that happens to me. It makes me... A difficult party guest. So I usually keep my mouth shut when people talk about J. Edgar Hoover cross-dressing or the cocaine and Coca-Cola <laughs> myth or things like that. But it's so interesting. You say you said in your email and also in an article that you sent to me from the Society of American Baseball Research, which is one of the best journals out there, that the, I repeated the Cartwright myth. And in fact, that Cartwright's, Alexander Cartwright's plaque in the Hall of Fame is sort of, you know, encompasses that in, in, in bronze, the whole myth. And <laughs> you said something like, and to have that many myths on one plaque is amazing, except in the Hall of Fame, where there are a lot of myths <laughs> written on the plaques. First, I want to say that your, your J. Edgar Hoover episode disappointed me greatly. Uh, sorry I'm, about that. I, we, we live in a lesser world for that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Hall of Fame... I have to be careful here. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you go to Cooperstown, and if you're a baseball fan, you you absolutely should. Yeah, it's wonderful. And the Hall of Fame is really three institutions under one roof. You have the museum, which is an excellent sports museum. And since I'm a 19th century guy, I, I really appreciate that they gave extensive space to 19th century baseball. Yeah. And there was a research library kind of tucked in the back. You could visit and not realize that it was back there. And it is an excellent specialized academic research library yeah so absolutely. If, if you want to do serious baseball history research you know that's major port of call and then you have the room with the plaques uh -huh. which by the way is much smaller than most people think when i went there yeah. i was shocked it was very small yeah and they're 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 coming close to being able to see running out of space yeah, a couple yeah, of years ago yeah. i was talking to one of the guys there you know what they're how they're going to cram more in there but the room with the plaques is where you get all these arguments, you know, should Harold Baines be in the Hall of Fame? Right. So that's one area of controversy. And the more obscure area of controversy is that when you look at particularly the early ones, because the Hall of Fame goes back to the 1930s, yeah. they didn't really understand 19th century baseball back then, which is odd because they were so much closer to it. Right, right. So some of the, the factual assertions that we find on you know, literally cast in bronze, yeah. are extremely questionable. Okay. And that the Alexander Cartwright one is the most wrong of the bunch, which, you know, it has some competition. Yeah, that's what you that said in your, is, is, in your email. <laughs> you said, really <laughs> spectacularly wrong. Yeah. On, on, I, I think they got his, his you know, birth and death dates right, but Everything, beyond yeah. that. Well, and that's too bad because, because you know, people – you know, the ordinary public goes to the Hall of Fame, and if something's in the Hall of Fame, and especially given the fact that, you know, the process of nowadays of getting in the Hall of Fame is such a, uh, so complicated, and people dig into stats so... And, and very public. And, and very public, d dig into stats so deeply, you think that these things are seriously researched, but of course, as you say, the early ones aren't. So, so people, because it's in the Hall of Fame, they believe it must be true. Yeah, and as a 19th century baseball guy, one of the things that fascinates me is how pre-dead ball baseball dropped out of the baseball consciousness. Yeah. And, and it did it very quickly. So you, you have things like, you know, ask somebody when was the first World Series, and they'll tell you 1903. Yeah, which is what I would say, yeah. You know, there, there was a series of championships between the two major leagues the National League and the American Association in the 1880s. Ah. And it was called the, the, you know, the World Series or the World Championship. You know, the word world was prominently featured. And then if you look in, you know, the 19 aughts, 
they they knew about that because it had only been yeah. you know, 10, 20 years earlier. Within a generation. And, yeah. yeah. So the sports writers all knew perfectly well that this had happened. So you can find discussions of the World Series between the American League and the National League where they explicitly cast it as a revival of this earlier World Series between the National League and the American Association. Mm -hmm. And by the 30s, those guys had all retired. Oh, right. So the sports writers in the 30s, you know, they when they thought of early baseball, they were thinking, you know, Ty Cobb and Cy Young. Yeah. And it completely dropped out of the consciousness. So as a 19th century baseball historian, a lot of it is trying to revive this era that had been forgotten and is dismissed quite unfairly, quite unreasonably. And it's often very interesting because they were figuring it out. That, yeah, that's uh, yeah, one of the that's fascinating right. yeah. areas. You know, baseball was the first professional league sport mm -hmm. for team sports. Right. And how you do that is, you know, if, if you decide that you want to, you and seven of your closest friends want to go form a, uh, you know, a highlight league yeah. you know what you're aiming for and they didn't know what they were aiming for they were inventing it as they went along well unlike the plaque in cooperstown in the hall of fame the blog post for my show can be amended so the the blog post <laughs> where i where i've put the abner doubleday myth up and then repeated the alexander cartwright one are going to be amended and are going to have re links to this show so let's just briefly if you will explain not only why the doubleday myth is a myth why and why the Cartwright myth is a myth, but perhaps more importantly for our listeners, how those myths sort of got reinforced in the consciousness as being true. The Doubleday myth came about in response to certain external cultural imperatives. Right. In the 1860s, there were lots of forms of baseball. 50, in the 50s and 60s, and you go back earlier, because it was a folk game, and folk games don't have a single unified way that you play it. It's very regional. So the, the the short version is that the modern baseball arose in New York City, and it arose in the 1840s, but it was not the only way that baseball was played until the late 1860s. Mm -hmm. So if in 1860, you say, you could easily say, yeah, this is how we play baseball in New York, but this is how they play baseball in Boston. This is how they play baseball in Chicago, you know, these, these exactly, can all be yeah. different ways. So when people said, oh yeah, and they played in England, where it's called rounders, that, that was uncontroversial. Yeah, yeah. And you'll find baseball kind of started becoming a prominent thing in American culture in the late 1850s. And you, you find these gossipy letters in, in you know, an American paper or an English paper where they're saying, you know, kind of, you know, what what's going on in New York? You know, this would be in a, in a London paper. And They'll say, oh, yeah, baseball is all the rage, which is you people call rounders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody raised an eyebrow. It was just an obvious statement of truth. Yeah. But then you you go forward a couple decades you know, into the 1880s, and now there is a set of rules. You you know, we, we have set, published, written rules, and this is what baseball is. So they would look at rounders and say, that's not baseball. Right. Because it's very, rounders is very informal. Well, that's not even the point. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure. The, yeah. I mean, the, the point is, is whatever rules they had were not identical or even, you know, there, there were some obvious differences between how rounders was played and how baseball was played in the 1880s. And again, this is one of these people forget pretty quickly. By the 1880s, they were forgetting that, yeah, you know, throwing the ball at the runner to put him out. That's how we used to do it, too. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they would look at rounders and say, well, that's not how it's done in baseball. Yeah. So the idea that tying baseball to rounders seemed less plausible on its face in the 1880s. And then the second thing is, you know, the rise of jingoism, nationalism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and anti-British sentiment in particular. So it became more offensive to suggest that baseball came from England, oh. <laughs> more politically incorrect. Yeah. And this also was as baseball was kind of becoming tied to American culture, you know, not merely as a game that we play, but, you know, a, a manifestation of the American character. Mm -hmm. So saying that it comes from England becomes really offensive. And that that's how it's often cast at the time, is patriotism demands that baseball have an American origin. So then it, did it ha need to have an American inventor uh, in, in the singular? I think that that was not quite 
as an imperative, uh-huh. but at the same time, that that's kind of how they thought this was the age of Thomas Edison. Right. <laughs> and, and of course, we know that Thomas Edison was not quite the singular inventor that he presented himself to be, but that's how people thought. Sure. So it becomes a, a natural thing to look for is a singular inventor. And what they knew, they, they never thought that the invention was from nothing. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. They always acknowledged that there was a long tradition of bat and ball games. The issue was at what point is a bat and ball game baseball versus some predecessor that was not baseball. Yeah. And they always pegged that to being in the second quarter of the 19th century because as I said earlier that the new, you know, the New York version arose then. So when they were saying this is the origin of baseball, what they were thinking was the origin of that New York version. Right, right. And they had a pretty good idea of when that happened. And they were trying to identify some split where you can say the earlier version was not baseball and now it is baseball. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's where they were looking for that that inventor, the American boy genius, who who took that predecessor game and turned it into baseball. And is that where the Doubleday thing starts? The Doubleday arises because there was this fellow named Henry Chadwick, who was a very prominent baseball journalist and had been around forever. His career spanned about 50 years. And he had all along said that baseball came from rounders. He was of English birth. Mm -hmm. You know, his family came to America when he was quite young, but he was old enough so that he would remember rounders that he had played in England. And so he remembered and knew perfectly well that it was essentially the same game. And as this became a politically unacceptable position, <laughs> what helped Chadwick was that he was personally popular. Everybody seemed to like the guy. Yeah. So they would say, well, he's of English birth. So his, his English patriotism would naturally lead him to this conclusion, which is clearly wrong. Yeah. But we'll give him some slack because what do you expect? But he kept on putting forth the English origin. And so Albert Spalding had been a star player in the, the late 60s and early 70s. And then he entered sporting goods manufacture, which is how we still know the name today. Mm-hmm. And he ended up as the owner of the Chicago club. So, you know, he, he was a very prominent person in baseball. And Spalding decided that he needed So Spalding formed a commission in 1905. It was headed by Abraham Mills, who had been an amateur player back in the 60s, and he was the National League president for a couple of years. His day job was he was a vice president with Otis Elevator Company. Ah. And uh, whenever I'm at the Hall of Fame, I criticize them for not having Otis Elevators. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So Mills headed this commission, and there were, I I believe, seven members. They were all prominent, very respectable people who were connected with baseball. There were two former U.S. senators, you know, that that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, There were no historians on there, of course. In fairness, historians didn't think of sports as being a, a topic at that time. But they never intended to go diving into archives and libraries. Their method was to put out a call to ask for old timers to send in their reminiscences. Mm -hmm. And they solicited some from people that they knew, but they put out this cattle call. It was published in newspapers across the country. So that's where the Abner Doubleday comes from, because Mills knew about the Knickerbockers, who were founded in 1845. And his fallback position was going to be that the Knickerbockers invented baseball. Okay. Kind of collectively, which goes back to your question, did they need a single inventor? They didn't need one, but they preferred one. That's a better story. You can say this guy invented baseball, not this group of guys. Yeah. So how did they how did they end up picking or choosing Abner Doubleday, a Civil War officer? So in your earlier podcast, you mentioned Abner Mill, right. Abner Graves. Abner Graves was a mining engineer. I believe he was in Colorado at the time, but he had grown up in Cooperstown and he responded to that cattle call. He read it in one of the papers and he said, aha. Uh-huh. And he wrote a letter talking about how when he was a young boy in Cooperstown, this older boy yeah. taught him baseball, which is entirely unremarkable. Sure, I sure. Mean, that, that's how you learn baseball. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and he furthermore said that the older boy was Abner Doubleday, the Civil War general. And 
could have been, I guess. I mean, who who yeah, who, well, who knows? Yeah. But what I tell people is if you played baseball in high school and one of your teammates was this guy named Aaron Judge, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. one of your teammates hit this towering fly ball that, you know, went further than anybody had ever seen, you're going to tell the story that Aaron Judge hit that ball. Yeah. Even if it was actually Joe Schlobotnik. Yeah, right, you know? right, 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 right. That's just how human memory works. So this older boy taught Abner Graves baseball. This older boy was Abner Doubleday. And then the third part is he said, and Doubleday had just invented the game. Now, why, why did Graves think that? He thought that because the Mills Commission had told him that. They had said, send us your memories about early baseball because we are trying to find who invented it. Oh, right. They were looking specifically, they were asking people specifically to name one person. They were telling people that your earliest memory very well might be the invention. Wow. And why did they believe that? I mean, it, it's an absurd research plan. Sure, sure. In lawyer speak, they were asking a leading question. Right, right, right. They, they were leading the witness. That's where Graves got it from. So he sends this letter, and you know, Mills and Spalding get it, and they kind of jump on it because it's a great story. You know, Doubleday was a Civil War hero. Right. Yeah. You know, if you had said Ulysses Grant had invented baseball, people would kind of, you know, that's that's a little too, that's going too far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Doubleday was was a guy, but he wasn't a top rank guy, so it's sort of plausible, to, you know, and and yet really impressive. You know, it's not that they didn't have other letters. Yeah. They could have chosen other ones, but this was such a great story that they leapt right on it. So that's that is where it comes from. And then they then published it as a, or or sort of sanctioned it, sanctioned it as the official story. Yes, yeah. So the commission issued a report in early 1908, mm -hmm. and it was widely published. And you know, you you can find it online if pretty easily. And it says this is how baseball was invented. Wow. And most people just took that at face value. I sure. Mean, and why wouldn't yeah. they? You read it in print. From an authoritative source. Is there any evidence that Doubleday knew or found out that he was uh, chosen as the, or that he was selected as the inventor? Had he lived that he'd, long? He'd been dead for, dead for 10 years. He'd been years. dead for 10 years. Another convenient thing. He couldn't come out and say, yes. no, I learned it from some other older boy. And he learned it from some other <laughs> older boy, which would have been more accurate. And furthermore, both Albert Spalding and Abraham Mills knew him personally. Oh, well, there you go. Mills had been in the the same section of the, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was you know post-Civil War veterans group. Right. And Mills had actually organized Doubleday's funeral. Oh, okay. And Spalding was involved with theosophy, uh -huh. which was an early you know, Eastern religion movement in America. And so was Mills. So again, they, they knew each other personally. So I get the feeling that Spalding always knew that this story was nonsense. Uh -huh. But Spalding also wasn't above telling a nonsensical story <laughs> if it served his purposes. Mills was kind of more of a straight shooter. He put effort into trying to figure out how baseball got from Cooperstown, which is, if you've ever been to Cooperstown, you know it's not near anything. No, it's way out in western New York. And so he was trying to figure out how it got from Cooperstown to New York City, which suggests that he at least tentatively believed the story, because otherwise, why bother? Right, if you, right, if right, right. If you're right. just going to make stuff up, just make stuff up. Later, though, it's only slightly later, there's the realization that the double they thing is a myth, but we need, we almost it's almost as if the culture says we still need an inventor. Is that how the Cartwright story then becomes prevalent, or is a Cartwright story something that his that early historians later identify and and pr promote? The Cartwright story came out at exactly the same time as the Doubleday story. Oh, oh, okay, okay. The way I put it is the Doubleday story came out of the front door, and the Cartwright story came out the back door. Okay, this was. A nonsensical story was obvious to some people at the time. Yeah. And William Rankin was a New York baseball writer, a quite prominent in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he promulgated the Alexander Cartwright story. And we can, we can go down a rabbit hole of how he got there, but it's quite a rabbit no, hole. No, let's, let's skip it. Let's, let's skip not. Over. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about Alexander Cartwright, who, unlike Doubleday actually did play baseball. Yeah. He was a founding member of the Knickerbocker Club. Okay. And that was in 1845. And there is one story about him from 1866 
that he was the guy that stood up and said, hey, guys, let's form a club. Mm -hmm. This has been improved to he founded the Knickerbockers, which is not quite the same no, thing. No. He was part of the committee that went out and recruited members and, and so on and so forth. So he was one of the founders of the club. And he does seem to be the guy that suggested the club. And if you believe that the Knickerbockers were the first baseball club, then that's really kind of something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they weren't. Yeah. They they weren't they weren't even close. But for a long time, people did believe that. So that was certainly a reason to give him credit. And that is the the kernel of truth that led William Rankin to promoting him as the inventor of baseball. But it's a small kernel. So. To answer your question, you know, kind of after the commission, Rankin is pushing Cartwright from the start. So people had this, you know, cognitive dissonance. Right, we right, have two right. stories with no real, no good way to choose between them. So they combine the two. So Doubleday ends up being the inventor in 1839. Then Cartwright improves the game, inventing modern baseball ah. in 1845. So you have a six-year gap there. And this is why having a plaque for Cartwright in Cooperstown makes sense. Okay. But but he's not the first person to codify the rules. He's not the first person to... Well, as, as you say, he didn't organize the first team. And he did not... He absolutely did not write the rules because the same source from 1866 that tells him that story that he said, hey, let's form a club. Yeah. They also describes the process and there was a committee to draft the rules. Yeah. And that committee was William Wheaton and William Tucker. Right. And Cartwright was not, was on not it. <laughs> in it. <laughs> and Cartwright was not an officer of the club at first. He would later on. He, you know, he did serve as an officer several times, but he was not one of the first officers, which if he were, you know, the, the singular driving force behind this, that would be odd. Yeah. And then he went off to California to, to join the gold right, rush. Right. So he was actually only with the Knickerbockers a few years, and he went to California. And here's a pro tip. It turns out that standing up to your hips in ice melt while, while you're panning for gold oh, right, right, right. is not... A, is, is not as much fun as yeah, it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's more fun than that? Living in Honolulu. Ah, and so that's what he did. So he ended up living in Honolulu as a, as a merchant and did quite well. And he spent the rest of his life there. Yeah. With apparently no connection to baseball whatsoever. You know, e even after baseball reached Honolulu. Right. And um, his grandson, Bruce Cartwright, after his death, took up the cause because he did somehow decide that grandpa had invented baseball <laughs> and he, he really pushed it in. And that's, he pushed it to the hall of fame when the hall of fame was brand new. Ah, And if you tried this with the hall of fame today, they tell you to go away. Yeah, exactly. At the time they were more open to kind of random stuff. Yeah. And at the same time, the Cartwright story had been floating around for, for 30 years by that time. So it was kind of a potential embarrassment giving him a plaque saying he invented modern baseball, which is what the, the plaque says. That was a compromise uh, to avoid controversy. But it could have easily have been the, the grandson, son, grandson of a couple of these other early Knickerbockers who could have pushed that, uh, pu pushed their, their ancestor. And, and that could have ended up being having a plaque. That person could have a plaque. It could be. And actually, William Wheaton, if you ask me who, who should have a plaque, but doesn't, I would put William Wheaton oh, in there. there. So then you go through the mid 20th century and kind of the, the standard version is, is Doubleday invented it, Cartwright perfected it. Right. Then in the late 60s, early 70s, Harold Peterson, he was a Sports Illustrated writer. He latched on to the Cartwright story and the fact that Doubleday story was nonsense. And he ran with it. He published a book, The Man Who Invented Baseball. It's out of print, but you can find it easily enough. Yeah. It tells you all you want to know. You know, the title tells you the whole mm -hmm. thing. But that was prominent enough at that point. The version that you gave in your previous podcast that Doubleday story is nonsense. Cartwright story is the real story. That actually comes from the Harold Peterson book. Ah, so it's a 70s myth, 60s, 70s myth. Well, it's a revival. Of course, Rankin had yeah, been well, saying yeah, the same exactly. thing all yeah, along. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that, that is why 
that kind of became the received wisdom. So if you're a baseball fan and you know one thing about the origin of baseball, you know that Abner Doubleday invented it. Mm -hmm. And if you know two things about the origin of baseball, you know that actually it was Alexander Cartwright. Right. So so I'm now teaching you three things about the origin of baseball. Right. <laughs> but, you know, this is so fascinating because one of the things on the show that we like to do, in fact, one of the purposes of starting the show was to try to help de-individualize history. This idea that, you know, Winston Churchill defeated the Nazis on his own, that there is one inventor, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb by himself, that Isaac Newton was the one scientists sitting under a tree that the apple fell on and therefore and then came up with the theory of gravity but w we know as historians that it's you know you know, there are for every individual hero that's put up there, there are at least a dozens and dozens of, of, if you will, lieutenants who did all the work. And very often, the original ideas uh, come from a group of people doing this thing. So, is it is it more fair to say that baseball was invented by all of the players of the amateur game you you talk about in your book that it developed organically that it developed by competing clubs coming up with, with different rules and then people deciding on which rules are, are the best is it, is it much more of a community slash regional slash national invention than an individual invention absolutely and you talk about developing organically that is very much until the late 1850s yeah yeah baseball began as an english book game and the earliest citation for the word baseball is from 1744. Right. That's why your your new book starts in 74. And it it's from a an English book of children's games, boys' games, which was a new genre then. And it has a woodcut with a picture where they're they're clearly not playing modern baseball, but you know you can see it. Yeah. And then there's a, a quatrain describing how the boy hits the ball and away it flies and he goes around and comes home. Sounds like baseball. Right. Then because this is 1744, there's a second quatrain giving a moral. Yeah. <laughs> which we can we, we can skip that. Yeah. So there are between one and two dozen references from the 18th century to baseball. One of them includes an extensive description. It's from a German book of games, and it has a section on English baseball. That is what he calls it. Oh, right. Okay. And he gives a, you know several pages devoted to describing how the game is played and you have two teams of equal number and you have one team that's out in the field and one team that is sending a series of guys up to try to bat the ball and if they bat the ball they're trying to run around these bases where while the fielding team is trying to put them out yeah that's baseball sure <laughs> if i give you a challenge to write a description of how baseball is played in under 100 words Mm -hmm. you, you would come up with something pretty close to that. Yeah. So it's brought to America by the colonists. It's just part of their, their shared cultural heritage. And it is played throughout Anglophone North America. Right. It's not a New York thing. It's not a New England thing. It's an English colonies thing. And it's a schoolyard game. And then in the 1820s, you're getting into the period of rising urbanism. And so you're having these young men who are moving into the city and they're becoming, you know, clerks and, you know, various sedentary occupations. So the concern was physical fitness, not a concern when you're living on a farm. No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you don't, you know, in a pre-industrial farm, getting exercise is not the issue. It's not hard, yeah. But it was an issue if you're a clerk in a store or in a lawyer's office. So there was a movement of finding physical fitness venues, methods, how, how to do this. And as we all know, if it's a fun way, you're going to do it more. Oh, sure. So the, there were discussions on the various options, and there were gymnasiums back then, and cricket was an option, but cricket involves a lot of standing around. Yeah. And fencing, you know, boxing, you know, the, these were all options. But one of the options that people – Cook was to form a baseball club. So you would have this club of 20 or 30 guys. And the idea was that you would meet, let's say, twice a week, two afternoons. Right. Which immediately tells you that we're dealing with a social class that can take two afternoons off. We're not talking about guys working in factories. Exactly. We're talking yeah. about yeah. white collar workers. And they would get together. And if you have 25 people show up, then you split them up into two teams of 12 and you have an umpire. Right. And you split them up 
exactly the way that you would expect. You have two captains and you say, I want Bob, I want Fred, I want Joe. <laughs> yeah. Just like back in the old days on, on the playground in the in our time. And they would spend the rest of the afternoon playing baseball and then they would go home. And that that's the baseball club that forms in the 1820s. That's the club that forms the Knickerbockers. Right. You know, the Knickerbockers operated exactly the same way. There was a predecessor group to the Knickerbockers. They called themselves the Gothams. And they were having this discussion of what game should we play. And they decided on baseball. But baseball at that time, you put a runner out by throwing the ball at him. And hitting him, yeah. Yeah. This is where William Wheaton, the name I, I gave before, where he comes in. Because he gave an interview in 1887, I believe it was, about what had happened. And he explains that the problem with throwing the ball at the guy, that's fine for boys. Yeah. Because they can't they can't put too much muscle behind the ball. But when a grown man is throwing the ball at you, it might hit you in a certain spot. Yeah. And you really don't want to have a ball hit you at that spot. <laughs> uh, he, he's really quite forthright about that. Yeah. So they came up with the idea of instead of throwing the instead of throwing the ball at him, you you have to touch the ball with him. Right. Touch him with the ball. Yeah. You have to hold it in your hand yeah. and touch him. Yeah. And that's one of the great breakthroughs. That's one of the defining characteristics of that version that the New York players came. So so the Knickerbockers did not even invent that, except that William Wheaton was also one of the Knickerbockers. Oh, he was on both clubs. Okay. Yeah. The, the Knickerbockers were, you know, split off from the Gothams, apparently amicably. I think it's just it seems to be that the Gothams were growing too fast. It was getting out of hand because Yeah, sure. You know, sure. If you have twenty guys showing up to play a game, you're you're good. If you have fifty guys, then you kind of got a problem. So that is where the Knickerbockers come from. But they came out of this tradition of this club exists for us to take our exercise together. Mm -hmm. And we want to take our exercise with people we like. You know, how well they play doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. You're right. You right. Know, if I'm on that club, I may be picked last because I'm a terrible player, but Somebody's going to be picked second to last on the other team, so it doesn't matter that I that I, I'm a terrible player. Yeah. So this goes along until the 1850s, when suddenly this whole thing balloons. You have this explosion of clubs starts in the the mid 1850s. So then you have to ask what what had changed, and what had changed was the rise of the ideology of muscular Christianity. Right. So this is the idea that a good Christian needs to be physically fit and strong so that he can better go forth and proclaim the gospel. Right. If you think in in the British context, you have these guys going out into the middle of Africa under just absolutely incredible physical difficulty, and and they were missionaries. Yeah, right. And whatever, whatever you think of that, it, it's an impressive thing for some guy from England to go off and do. Physically, yeah. Clearly, this was not something for weaklings. So the idea arose that exercise and therefore games, because again, you're more likely to actually get the exercise done if you're having fun. Yeah. So games were no longer a distraction. The older idea was that, you know, come on, you're, you're a grown man. You have two things to do. And one is to work yeah. to support your family. And the other one is to pray. Yeah. And anything beyond that was a distraction, if not a positive temptation to dissipation. Mm -hmm. But now you have this breakthrough where grown men playing sports is reasonable. Yeah. It's a respectable thing for respectable men to be doing, and it's even laudable. And I don't mean to suggest that all those baseball players were exercising so that they could better for go forth and proclaim the gospel. Right. I mean, they, they clearly weren't. No. But... It removed this cultural headwind where grown men playing the game was ridiculous. It was no longer ridiculous, and it turns out that a lot of people like to do it. So in lots of ways, what this is showing, by looking at baseball, we, we can hold up a mirror to all sorts of other things that are, were going on in American history and culture. You talked about the rise of urbanism. You talked about the rise of industrial work. You talked about the rise of the need for exercise. You talked about muscular Christianity. All these things are as one of the reasons you and I are both 19th century historians. This is a very dynamic and interesting period. It's almost cheating the rest of the people involved in early baseball by saying it's only it was Admiral Doubleday or by saying it was William Cartwright. 
There are all these fascinating things going on and all these people putting a lot of energy into it. So what, you, what you've done throughout your baseball history research is really contextualize it in a very fantastic way. Is, am I, after, you, after all, you've corrected me, first of all, with the, the car right But I'm, am I now more on the better path of understanding that, that it is so much broader than I thought before? Absolutely. As I put it, baseball is part of American culture. Yeah, yeah, Therefore, yeah. baseball history is cultural history. Yeah. And if you approach it as something apart from the broader culture, then you end up with history as, you know, one thing after another. Yeah, exactly. And you end up with history as answers to a series of trivia questions. Who invented baseball? Right. That's a trivia right, question. Right, right. Now, baseball fans do love to battle trivia and stats against each other, but that in itself doesn't help our understanding of history. Exactly. If you know that Ty Cobb has the highest lifetime batting average, that's an interesting, that's a good trivia question and a good trivia yeah. answer. But what does it tell you about what was going on other than that Ty Cobb was really good? Yeah. What we like to say in the show is that we need more history. We need to understand the whole context around Ty Cobb at the time. Exactly. Yeah. You and I are simpatico. Good. Good. Well, we are. We especially are now. And I love, by the way, Buzzkillers, I love to be corrected. So if I get stuff wrong, please email me as uh, Richard did. And by, and you must, we're going to put on the Buzzkill bookshelf, your first book, which came out in 2019, Strike Four. The Evolution of Baseball, which as an introduction by John Thorne, one of the deans of, of the academic study of baseball. And we want to sort of foreshadow that your new book, The Rise of Baseball, 1744 to 1871, is under contract with the University of Missouri Press. And we're hoping it comes out, we think, spring 2024? That's if everything goes right. If, and that's the working title. We'll see if it sticks. Right. Okay. And, and of course, given the, the, the discussion we had, I know the buzz killers are going to want you to come back on the show. So are you willing to come back on and talk more about the details? I would love to. Okay. I can talk endlessly. You've, you've, you've realized that by now. Okay. <laughs> well, buzz killers, now you, now you know that I've been put uh, now I've been knocked down a few pegs, and that's a good thing. And you've also been introduced to an important historian, Richard Hirschberger. You've int been introduced to the Society for American Baseball Research, which I'm going to put a uh, link to their website on the blog post. And of course, you've been interested, introduced to these new books. So thanks again for coming on the show, Richard. Thank you for having me. And we'll talk to all of you buzzkillers next week. Mm -hmm.